The Voice of Russia World Service presents another edition of The Christian Message from Moscow. Recently, a book came off the press in Russia entitled Flowers for the Savior. It was published by the Belarusian Exarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. This is a wonderful volume of true stories, which we shall begin acquainting you with today. Today, you will hear the story Pink Dress, read for you by Svetlana Yekimenko. The beginning of this story can be referred to the times when our country was still called the USSR, and I was an awkward teenage girl. My mother had died, and father, in search of earnings and possibly a new wife, traveled all across this country, never putting down roots any place for long. For me and my brother, it was grandma who took the place of our parents. The three of us lived on the outskirts of a big city in an old house. Occasionally, father sent us money transfers, but his help was rare and hardly sufficient. Meanwhile, grandma's small pay barely covered our basic needs. So that is why we eventually decided to put up one of our rooms for rent. Thus, a young woman by the name of Marina appeared in our home. She was tall, slender, and very attractive. She studied at the university at the journalism chair. The tenant turned out to be a friendly young woman with a ready smile. I enjoyed spending my free time with her, chatting about everything and anything, sipping tea with candy unhurriedly in our kitchen. Oh, the things we talked about. We discussed the city news, argued, debated about the books we'd read theatrical productions and concerts. I really came to love Marina. She became my friend and older sister, counseling me on everything. Only grandmother somehow continued to grumble. She's got a sharp tongue, that Marina. Grandma also noted that the tenant was always alone and avoided encounters with potential husbands. Marina spent her free time studying or going to concerts and museums with the girlfriends, while on other occasions she would go on trips to the countryside to see the sights. Marina often took me with her. Thanks to her efforts, I was in the know about all events of the cultural life of our town. And another thing, Marina was good at singing folk songs and ballads. She possessed a rich, resonant and quite remarkable voice timbre. On one occasion, I was able to reveal the mystery shrouding Marina's private life. I found out why someone as lovely and good as her was so lonely. One day, I came back from school early and heard muted sobs echoing from our tenant's room. Concerned, I slightly opened the door and saw the girl weeping, her face nestled against some rose-white, shiny piece of fabric. Noticing me, Marina signaled me to enter the room and pointed to a chair. 
I entered and sat down. For a while, she continued to sob and sigh. Then she wiped her tears and spread out on the sofa the shiny rose-white material she'd been hugging to herself. It turned out to be a floor-length rose-white dress embroidered in shiny pearly beads. This sort of rose hue one can sometimes witness on the sky on a wintry morning at dawn break. Marina sighed heavily and asked, Isn't it beautiful? I nodded, trying to picture Marina in the gown, while she continued, I suppose you're wondering why I was weeping so over this dress. So be it, I shall tell you. And then she narrated her story to me. Marina was born and grew up in a small town. After school, she came to the capital, entered university. At one of the parties, she met a certain Alexander. They began to see each other. Alexander's parents were high-ranking people, but of course a 19-year-old girl never dreamt that this fact could be an impediment to their happiness. She was in love and nurtured radiant hopes of happiness. A year later, the two decided to marry, and it was then that Marina bought the rose-white dress. Marina was introduced to the parents of her intended and produced an overall positive impression. However, that wasn't enough, and the future father and mother-in-law evinced a desire to meet Marina's parents. They went on a trip to the small town where her parents lived and visited her home. There, they discovered that besides a father who drank heavily and a sweet but somewhat high-strung mother, Marina had a younger brother, Alexei, who had the Down syndrome. He was good and kind, but not like everyone else. After this visit, Marina learned that Alexander's parents became opposed to their marriage. They started pressuring their son to break up with Marina immediately and threatened to cut him off if he disobeyed. One of their main arguments was, Do you want us to have grandchildren the likes of Marina's brother? Alexander was into the last year of studies at a prestigious institute. His parents could set him up with a highly paid job, The young man had a brilliant career lined up, but without Marina. Such was the condition set by his parents. Many tears were shed, many words said. Finally, the young people broke up. Alexander cast Marina from his life. The feeling was as if part of my soul had died, she said to me. I had become like stone. It is hard to describe the state I was in then. The only place I could find solace was church. My feet carried me there of their own accord, and I would weep silently there in a corner, gazing at the icons of the Saviour and the Holy Mother of God. Much time has passed since then, but Marina's spiritual wound continued to cause her pain, which is why she did not seek new acquaintances, although she had many admirers. Soon Marina left our home and we lost touch. Time passed. Perestroika dawned. Grandmother went on pension, and my brother was serving in the army, while father worked far away from us in Tumen in West Siberia. I finished school studies and entered the journalism department of the university. Marina's influence, no doubt. It was round about that time that I met Marina again. On the eve of that encounter, I had finally broken off with my young man, 
our relationship had entered an impasse. I wanted to get married and have children, while he was in no rush to take on such responsibilities and wanted an easy life without commitment. None of us was willing to compromise. Tears streaming down my face, confused and desolate, I was walking across the old park towards my home, and before I noticed it, I had reached the church. The evening service was underway. I approached the candle box to buy some candles and stopped in my tracks. Selling the candles was none other than Marina. She had put on weight but was just as lovely. Our gazes met and she immediately recognized me. Anichka, how charming you've grown, she exclaimed joyously. Wait till the service is over and then we can talk. After service, we sat at length, talking on a bench near the church, exchanging news. I discovered that after finishing university, Marina was offered a job at the editorial office of the town newspaper of Sergiev Posad, outside Moscow, where the famous Holy Trinity St. Sergius Monastery is located. Marina began to attend church services there. Then she started singing in the church choir. She made the acquaintance of a student of the seminary and married him. She gave birth to three lovely children, two boys and a girl. Her parents were still alive, while her brother Alexei had died. People with Down syndrome do not have a long lifespan. Our angel has gone to the heavens, said Marina. But prior to that, he lived in France for two years and worked in a special hotel where all the staff were people like him. One of our relatives helped us find a place for Alexei there. He was so happy, he found so many new friends. You know, the main thing that I discovered was that you needn't fear to live. You just have to live and pray to God, love and suffer, and be grateful to God for everything, while before I actually feared life, not anymore. Saying our goodbyes, Marina and I promised each other to visit and keep in touch. The following day I went shopping in the city center. I needed to buy winter boots and some other items. In the shop window of one store, I saw a long rose-white silk dress decorated with hand embroidery. It was worthy of the most exacting bride. And I bought it. We continue our program. Listen to another story from the book. This one is entitled Happiness Obtained by Prayer. Joyce Tatiana dashed out of the Institute building. She had just passed her last exam for the second year. A week later she and Vladimir would be married and that same day wed in church. Tatiana reflected. How thoughtful and kind he is. How we love each other. 
He's so wonderful. I can find no fault with him whatsoever. No wonder my friend says that in him I shall have a solid wall to lean on. These thoughts whirled in Tatiana's head. She smiled and waved a hand to her intended, who was waiting for her in the park opposite the institute. However, when Tatiana reached the dormitory, a telegram was waiting for her with the tragic news that her sister Zinaida had died. Tatiana was bewildered. What on earth had happened? Zinaida was almost never ill. It transpired that Zinaida had been killed by her own husband in a drunken rage. Her two-year-old son Igor was weeping inconsolably and repeating the same question over and over again: "Where is my mother?" Tatiana picked him up, held him tightly, and said, "I am your mother now, Igor, and that's all there is to it." However, to Tatiana's surprise, her beloved Vladimir wasn't at all enthusiastic about her decision to adopt the boy. He wasn't at all interested in someone else's child when he most likely would have his own offspring soon. He insisted that Yegor be sent to an orphanage. The state could look after him. Tatiana was shocked. Apparently, she didn't at all know this man she was about to marry. Without much deliberation, she chose the child. Over her intended. The authorities did not allow Tatiana to adopt Igor, but she was granted child custody. Tatiana often thought of Vladimir, reliving the anguish of his betrayal. She knew she ought to forget him, but it was not easy to do since she still loved him. Tatiana started attending church; that was the only place she found solace, and gradually. The pain in her breast subsided. Tatiana tried her best to be a good mother to the boy. At the institute, she transferred to the correspondence department to be able to get a day job, and found employment at a local department store. After all, she had to provide for herself and the boy. With God's help, she managed pretty well in her circumstances and carried all the burden of responsibility on her fragile shoulders. Finally, her studies were completed, and Tatiana took on employment as head stock clerk at the department store. By then, Igor had turned seven and was going to school, the first grade. Everything seemed to be going well. However, with his constant dreams of a father, the boy tormented Tatiana. If I had a father, he would say, we could make a kite or a birdhouse, and Dad could teach me to play chess. Listening to her son, Tatiana could barely hold back the tears. Only in church, whilst praying, she found peace of mind. Once, as she was praying, tears streaming down her cheeks before the icon to the Holy Mother of God, a young man took notice of her. He had come to pray to Saint Nicholas the Miracle Maker before setting out on a long trip. His name was Victor. The sight of the weeping girl stirred sympathy in his heart. Waiting for her to come out of the church, he approached her and asked, "Has something happened, young lady?" "No." Everything is fine. The young people began talking. Before they knew it, they had reached the bus stop. Suddenly, Victor asked, 
Are you married? No, but I have a son. And Tatiana proceeded to tell Victor her story. When she was through, Victor said, Right now, I'm going off on holiday to visit my mother in Latvia. But a month later, on October the 15th, let's meet right here, near the church. Why are you silent? Say yes. I've never made a date like this before. All right. A month passed in anxious anticipation. Tatiana doubted their encounter would ever take place, but nonetheless, she went to the church. However, as promised, Victor was there, waiting for her. He seemed nervous. If only she would come. Oh, I should have postponed that trip. As it was, I spent the whole holiday thinking of her. Finally, Tatiana showed up, and Victor hurried towards her. Two months later, Victor proposed to Tatiana. She was stunned. You haven't forgotten that I have a son. But I love you, and we shall bring Igor up together, if you like. Can you play chess? Yes, <laughs> I can, and I shall teach our Igor too, so that we can play together. In that case, I agree. Victor and Tatiana were wed in church, and Tatiana wept with joy. This was happiness obtained by prayer to the Lord and the Holy Virgin. while Igor boasted to his mates, My father is the best in the world. But didn't you say your dad was dead? asked one boy. This father is alive and he loves me. I have his name now. Igor immediately started calling Victor dad although no one told him to do so, while Victor really came to love the boy and lavished all his free time on him. You're listening to true stories from the book Flowers for the Savior, published by the Belarusian Exarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church, which recently came off the press in Russia. We shall continue acquainting you with the stories taken from that book in the following edition.
And there we end another edition of The Christian Message from Moscow. It was directed by Vladimir Demin, editor of text and music Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Nadezhda Smirnova, and your hosts Svetlana Yakimenko and Pavel Novichkov. Tune in same time next week. All the very best to you and may God save you from all evil, visible and invisible. In the voice of Russia World Service, welcome to another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. As was promised, today we continue acquainting you with the book Flowers for the Savior. It was published by the Belarusian Exarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church and recently came off the print in Russia. Right now we offer you a story which gave the title to the whole book, Flowers for the Savior, read for you by Pavel Novichkov. Farewell, school. Today is the graduation ball. All graduates receive secondary education diplomas. Oleg graduates with honors. This opens vast opportunities for entering any higher education establishment he chooses. But he has one dream only, that of becoming a test pilot. This profession embraces everything he particularly values. Romanticism, courage and valor. There is music everywhere. Joy on the faces of the graduates occasionally gives way to sadness at bidding farewell to one's school years. And it's incredibly hard to part with those you formed a fast friendship with throughout the school years. And finally, the last dance is announced, the traditional school waltz. Oleg threw a glance in the direction where a moment ago there was a bevy of girls. The only one left standing there was Kira, quiet, modest, plain Kira from his class. No one ever paid any attention to her, and it looked like she had meekly reconciled herself to that. On an impulse, Oleg decided he'd invite her to dance. Well, after all, it was the last dance. It was pretty obvious. Nobody else would invite her. He felt sorry for the girl. (music) 
As Alec approached Kira, she raised a surprised glance at him, and Alec was stunned to see what lovely blue eyes she had. This girl he'd studied in the same class with for eleven years. Unbelievable! He never realized she had such kind, incredibly beautiful eyes. His heart missed a beat. They decided the whole class would go to greet the dawn on the embankment. They made their way there through the park. Alec took Kira's hand, and thus they walked along the lit alley. When the time came to say goodbye, Alec gently squeezed Kira's fingers. After dawn break, they all went home. Kira's beautiful eyes haunted Alec for a long time. Years passed. Alec and Kira got married. He had achieved his life goal and become a test pilot, while she was a doctor. Once, when Alec returned from a business trip, Kira suggested, "Let's go to church." Um, what for? We can go and buy some candles and light them for the Lord in gratitude for all He's given us. <laughs> Just what exactly? Well. The fact we are together, and that your flights are successful and safe. After all, it's all God's will. Well, what what has God's will to do with it? If I hadn't invited you to dance that time, our paths would never have crossed. That's just it. It was the Lord's doing. I liked you since first grade, and at the graduation ball, who suggested that you invite me to dance? You never paid the slightest attention to me before. Nothing happens by chance in this life; it's all God's will and providence. Every time you have your test flights, I pray for you to the Lord, asking Him to keep you safe and bring you back to me. Kira, darling, everything you are talking about is just fate. <laughs> Let's have an understanding about this. I don't want you to pray for me. And I am not going to church. Thank you very much. And the less said about this, the better. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I shouldn't have taken this up with you. You're just not ready yet. Your time has not yet come. Days passed. Kira continued to pray for her leg. And every time he returned from his flights, she lit a candle in the church in gratitude to the Lord. Once, as Kira was expecting Alec from a business trip, she was informed his stay had been extended for a month. At that time, Alec was in hospital with grave burns of the face and hands. His friends kept telling him how amazingly lucky he was to come out alive from the situation he'd found himself in. It was a miracle, they insisted. Alec kept silent. Well, because of the burns, he found it very painful to speak. Besides, he had no words to describe what had happened. But this is how it was. During that flight, the engine caught fire. Alec reported this to the flight's commander, 
and the latter ordered Alec to eject from the burning plane, since it was clear that Alec wouldn't manage to reach the aerodrome. However, Alec replied that down below there was a populated area, and there'd be many casualties if he catapulted and allowed the plane to fall onto the town. So he decided to try to fly the plane clear of the town limits. The flight commander again issued the order to catapult, and at that moment communications with the plane broke up. That is when a leg thought of God, and he prayed, "God, save me! Do not let me explode above the town. Let me make it to the fields." Meanwhile, people from the town outskirts were rushing outside and gazing in horror at the burning plane streaking across the sky, so low that it seemed it was about to descend on the houses at any moment. Due to the fire and smoke, Alec couldn't see anything, but he finally realized he'd left the town boundaries. Yet now the catapult refused to operate, and at that instant, the thought flashed through his mind. Lord, your will be done. If I come out of this alive, I shall go to church and become your servant. And at that instant, the catapult worked. A leg was hurtled upwards together with the chair, and the explosion followed, tearing the plane into bits. People from the town were running to help a leg. When a leg returned home. Kira was out. He left the flat and went to the florists to buy the biggest and most beautiful bouquet they had. The young florist asked him whom it was intended for, and he answered, "These are flowers for my savior." The girl asked who his savior was. "The Lord," replied Alec. In the church, a leg approached the cross and placed flowers at its feet. Suddenly, he became aware of someone standing next to him. Turning round, he saw Kira. There were tears in her lovely eyes. Years passed. Alang fulfilled his promise to the Lord. He received religious education and became a clergyman. Now they call him Father Alang and his wife Matushka Kira. They have a son, Sergey, for whom his father is more than a dad, but his spiritual mentor too. We continue our program in the series "The Christian Message from Moscow." We would like to offer you another story from the same book. This one is entitled "At the Precipice."
The blizzard howled, the terrifying wind tossed about in the treetops. It lashed out at the lone wayfarer, pressing him down to the ground, covering him with cold snow. Mm, some weather we're having, croaked Yakov, shivering in the cold and tucking his bluish nose deep into the collar of his long, well-worn coat. He was returning from the neighboring village from yet another drinking bout. The company had been rowdy and the drinks intoxicating, as always. That was the only life Yakov knew and wanted no other. And so now he was making his way with great difficulty through the blizzard. It shouldn't be long till he reached home, so why couldn't he see any village lights? Could he have lost his way? Yakov stopped and shrugged off the snow, trying to collect his thoughts. Suddenly, what a joy! His old friend was walking straight towards him and smiling. Hi there, Yashka! he said happily. You don't look like your usual self. Are you by any chance lost? <laughs> oh, let's cut straight across the forest. It'll be quicker, the friend exclaimed. So Yakov and his friend went off together. Yakov could hardly keep up with his old friend. While the latter marched on with ease and talked incessantly, Finally, he came to a stop and said, Well, mate, you need to go that way. He hugged Yakov, who felt a chill from that embrace. At that point, it occurred to Yakov, Eh, but didn't my friend die a year ago? He fell headlong down a ravine, lost consciousness and froze to death. Ah... Oh. It had been a dreadful winter that year. The hair on Yakov's head stood an end from fear. His legs felt like jelly and his hands shook. With cold, dry lips, he tried to form words and cried, Oh Lord, have mercy! He couldn't recognize his own voice. Rather, it wasn't a voice, but a croak. A shaking hand raised, with icy, trembling, crooked fingers, he crossed himself. Shutting his eyes firmly, for a moment Yakov stood stock still. Then he opened his eyes. The blizzard had died down, the wind had disappeared, peace and tranquility reigned all around. Yakov felt all his drunken stupor leave him, and a cover fell from his eyes. He looked about where he was standing and plead in terror. Right in front of him was a precipice and below a deep ravine. Just one more step and he would have been at the bottom of that ravine. Just one step separated him from sure death. Oh, thank God! Thank God, muttered Yakov, his lips moving with difficulty. On that very edge of the precipice, all his wayward life passed before his eyes in a flash. His youth, wife, work, children. Where had it all gone? How did it happen that none of this was left? Only a drunken and hazy blur. The snowflakes were slowly falling to the ground in a hypnotic dance. Yakov made his way home, his head hung low. His heart was heavy. In his passion-signed soul, there stood feeble hopes 
for the Lord's mercy and salvation. Now he was certain that he would never drink a drop of alcohol for the rest of his life. Returning home, Yaakov saw his mother standing on her knees in the light of the icon lamp and praying before the icon of the Holy Mother of God, dubbed Inexhaustible Chalice. While the Holy Virgin looked down tenderly from the icon at the grief-stricken old woman. You are listening to stories taken from the book Flowers for the Saviour, published by the Belarusian Exarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church, which recently came off the print here in Russia.
And there we end another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. It was directed by Vladimir Dyomin, editor of text and music Tatiana Shvitsova, the sound engineers Nadezhda Smirnova and Yelena Gashenikova, and your hosts Svetlana Yakimenko and Pavel Novichkov. Tune in again, same time, next week. All the best to you, and may God save you from all evil, visible and invisible.